In this video, we're going to discuss and demonstrate evaluation of the thoracic and lumbar spine for somatic dysfunction. So I'm going to be putting my thumbs and hands on a few different uh, places in your back. I'm going to be feeling for any areas that might be tender, and I'm going to be moving you around uh, a little bit. Is that okay? Yes. All right. So if you could turn around, face away from me. Our first step in evaluating the thoracic and lumbar spine is orienting ourselves to the spinous processes and the transverse processes. To orient ourselves to the spinous processes, we can use specific landmarks on the spine and on the arms and pelvis uh, to find the appropriate level and then move up or down to find a different level. We can use C7 to help us find T1, so moving to the cervical spine, finding the most prominent spinous process, and then moving down, we can find T1. We can use the spine of the scapula to find T3, finding the spine of the scapula, moving medial, and then directly medial from there, the spinous process we would expect to find would be T3. We can use the inferior angle of the scapula to help us find the spinous process of T7, so from here, We'd move directly medial and that spinous process would be T7. We can move down to rib 12 and then trace back along rib 12 and the spinous process we would expect to find would be T12. And then we could also use the iliac crest. So we form a table with our hands here at the iliac crest and then move directly medial and the spinous process we'd expect to find here is L4. So now that we've found our spinous processes, we can use the rule of threes to find uh, the appropriate transverse processes at each level. For T1 through 3, we can expect that the transverse processes are going to be at the same level of the spinous processes. For T4 through 6, we can expect the transverse processes are going to be half a level above the spinous processes. And then for T7 through 9, we would expect the transverse processes to be a full level above where we would find the spinous processes. Then for T 10. T10 is going to behave very much like T7 through 9, where the transverse process is going to be a full level above. For T11, that's going to behave like T4 through 6, where the transverse process is half a level above. And T12 is going to behave like T1 through 3, where the transverse process is going to be at the same level as the spinous process. So now that we've oriented ourselves to thoracic and lumbar landmarks, we can screen for areas of potential somatic dysfunction. There are a few different methods we can use for this. We're going to start with uh, screening for an area of greatest restriction. So we're going to start with our thumbs at the cervical spine, and we're going to be uh, just lateral to the spinous processes. And I'm going to start on the right side. We're going to use our other hand on top of the head, and we're going to use our thumbs to apply a medial and anterior force at the same time that we're going to add a little bit of side bending and rotation through the neck. And we're going to apply that in a rhythmic fashion down the cervical spine, through the upper thoracics, down to T4. And once we get to T4 and below, we're going to switch our contact from a thumb to our thenar eminence and our other contact to the shoulder. So our thenar eminence is going to be on the right side of this spinous process just hooking right into the channel uh, between the spinous process and the transverse process. We're going to be pushing anteriorly and medial, inducing a little bit of side bending at the same time that we're going to use this shoulder to induce a rotation counter force. And we're going to use that rhythmic fashion to assess for any additional areas of restriction. We're going to test the other side. Get to T4, switch to our thenar eminence. So I'm feeling some restriction right at T1. I'm also feeling some restriction somewhere between uh, T6 and T9. And I'm also feeling some restriction in the lower lumbars. Another method we can use to screen for areas of potential somatic dysfunction on the spine would be to just use our fingers along the spinous processes and to feel for any particularly prominent uh, spinous processes, prominent or displaced spinous processes. So they might be closer to the spinous process below, they might be deviated to the left or the right, they might feel like they're protruding uh, posteriorly, you might feel a little bit of a step off in certain areas. And again, as I'm feeling those spinous processes, 
I'm feeling an air restriction right at T1, another air restriction somewhere between T6 and T9, and then also in the lower lumbar area. We can also use our thumbs in the paraspinal area to appreciate for any uh, paraspinal hypertonicity as well as any asymmetry of the transverse processes. So if we just use our thumbs by themselves and attempted to push in that paraspinal area, uh, our patient's gonna end up uh, kind of pushing away from us. So to avoid that, we wanna use our hands gently making contact with the shoulders to provide a counter force so that we can allow our thumbs to dig a little bit deeper into the tissue. So now here in the T1 area, I'm feeling a little bit of a restriction here as I move further down. I'm also feeling some restrictions start at T6. So now as I switch from the upper thoracics to the middle thoracics, I'm gonna take my hands and put them along the ribs to provide that counter force. Okay. And I am feeling some restriction right here uh, between T6 or T7 through about T9. And then I continue down the lumbar spine and at the lower lumbars on this left side, I'm feeling some restriction. So now that I've identified some potential areas of restriction, I'm going to do some specific motion testing uh, to diagnose our specific somatic dysfunctions. There are many different ways that you can approach performing somatic dysfunction diagnosis, and I'm gonna review two commonly used approaches. So the first one is a long lever approach. So now going back to our uh, T1 segment, we're gonna take one hand and we're gonna contact uh, our spinous process of T1. We can also use our uh, thumb and middle finger to contact the transverse processes directly lateral uh, to the spinous process. And then we're gonna take our other hand and we're gonna hold the head and we're gonna put uh, the head, neck, and upper thoracic spine uh, into a series of ranges of motion. At each of these ranges of motion, we're gonna be appreciating for any uh, tug or pull um, that we would feel at uh, that specific segment. So first we're going to flex the cervical spine and we're gonna flex it only until we feel some motion at T1 and that's about it. And then we're going to extend. Okay. And then we're going to side bend to the right and side bend to the left. As we're testing each of these ranges of motion, we wanna appreciate uh, any restricted barriers or freedoms of motion that we might feel. And then rotate to the right and rotate to the left. So what I'm feeling right here is a relative freedom of motion in flexion. So as I flex, it feels uh, like a relative freedom of motion when I try to extend, it feels like there's a little bit of restricted barrier, like the um, uh, T1 doesn't seem to move very well. And as I side bend to the right, I feel like I hit a bit of a restricted barrier here. When I side bend to the left, I'm able to move uh, quite a bit more to the left before I feel that, uh, that same endpoint. And then when I rotate to the left, I'm also feeling a greater range of motion there. And when I rotate to the right, I'm feeling a little bit more of a restricted barrier. So now I can use that and identify or name my somatic dysfunction by the freedoms of motion. So, so far I have T1 that seems to have a freedom of motion in flexion, side bending to the left and rotation to the left. So I would name my T1 somatic dysfunction as flexed, rotated to the left, side bent to the left. Another method I can use to come up with the same diagnosis would be a uh, more short lever uh, motion testing. So I'm gonna place my thumbs right at the, the transverse processes of T1. So initially finding the spinous processes, then moving lateral to the transverse processes. And then I'm going to, again, use my hands to uh, stabilize the shoulders. Then I'm going to sink my thumbs through the paraspinal tissue until I feel uh, the transverse processes. And then I'm gonna center my dominant eye over those transverse processes and determine which uh, transverse process is more posterior. So in observing and also feeling, I'm observing that this left transverse process is more posterior. 
So now I can also use a little bit of short lever uh, motion testing by just pushing on the transverse processes, inducing rotation. So as I push on this right transverse process, I'm inducing rotation to the left. As I push on the left transverse process, I'm inducing rotation to the right. And I'm also feeling, again, a restricted barrier when I push on this left transverse process and a freedom of motion when I'm pushing on this right transverse process, suggesting a rotation of T1 to the left. Now I can test that asymmetry in flexion and extension by asking my patient to position her cervical spine into flexion and extension. So go ahead and um, bend forward, bend your head forward and touch your chin to your chest. As she bends her head forward, I'm determining whether I'm seeing an improvement of that asymmetry or worsening of that asymmetry. And what I'm seeing when she's in this flex position is that both the transverse processes appear to be more symmetric. I could also motion test that to confirm, and I do confirm that they are more symmetric. Can you come back up to the middle? And go ahead and look up to the sky and look behind you. And as she moves into extension, I'm feeling a little bit more asymmetry with the left transverse process moving further back into my thumb. And I can also further motion test that and I feel a uh, greater restricted barrier on this left side. So come back up to the middle. So now using this method, I can test rotation and then flexion extension and then use my Friette's principles to deduce my uh, somatic dysfunction. So now I had T1 that had a rotation preference to the left and it seemed to improve or become more asymmetric uh, when the patient's neck was in flexion. So that would suggest that it was a type 2 dysfunction which means that our somatic dysfunction for T1 is T1 flexed rotated left side bent left. So moving to our middle thoracic area we're gonna use our landmarks to orient ourselves. So we're gonna take our thumbs, put it on the inferior angle of the scapula, move medial, and that's gonna be T7 spinous process. Uh, we're gonna to wanna to move uh, to near the top of that group. So starting from T7 spinous process, we're gonna find our transverse processes, which are gonna be one full level above. So we're gonna find T6 spinous process, move directly lateral, and then that would be our T7 transverse processes. There is a little bit of asymmetry at T7, so we're going to move up a little bit further to see if T6 is also involved. So for T6, according to our rule of threes, it's going to be half a level uh, above the spinous process of T6. So we find T5, spinous process, and then our transverse processes are going to be half a level above. And I don't really see any asymmetry at T6, so we're going to move back down back down to T7 and we're going to put our thumb and middle finger on the transverse processes and move our index finger back down to spinous process of T7 which is one full level below and then we're going to use a long lever approach. So now from here monitoring and you can either monitor just the spinous process or just the transverse processes um, or all three we can use a long lever approach by uh, grabbing each of the shoulders and passively moving our patient into rotation in each of the directions. So rotation to the right, rotation to the left, and I am feeling a little bit of freedom of motion in rotation to the right. We can also side bend our patient, bending them to the left, then bending them to the right. And I'm feeling a little bit of a freedom of motion in side bending to the left. And then we can also bend them forward. So coming from the upper thoracic region and then uh, just asking them to slump forward, go ahead and slump forward and then inducing additional flexion. And then you can also come in front of their shoulders and induce a little bit of extension. And we're not really, I'm not really noticing too much uh, of a difference in either flexion or extension. If you're finding it difficult to uh, determine uh, your motion asymmetries using this, um, this approach, you can uh, get a little more detailed information by uh, making a little bit more contact with your patient and getting a little more control of their movement. Uh, can you go ahead and just gently cross your arms in front of you? So now, coming again to our T7, we can sit alongside our patient, stand alongside our patient, and then use our arms gently over their arms and then from here we can better control our rotation, 
our side bending, and also our flexion extension. Go ahead and slump forward. And then with extension, we want to make sure that we're pivoting over that one segment. So we're kind of pushing forward at the same time that we're extending. Okay. So again, I'm not feeling too much of a difference in flexion extension. I also felt that right rotation was a freedom of motion and left side bending was a freedom of motion. That would suggest a neutral type dysfunction, uh, which often occurs in groups and we were feeling some other segments that were asymmetric. So I'm just going to quickly uh, use a short lever approach to uh, first re-diagnose uh, T7 and then diagnose the rest of the segments. So starting again, finest process of T7. And here's our transverse processes. Again, grabbing the rib cage. I'm seeing clearly that the right transverse process is posterior. I can also motion test that and confirm. Yes, that right transverse process is posterior, suggesting a rightward rotation of T7. Go ahead and bend your head forward and slump forward. And then with flexion, I'm not seeing too much difference. Look up to the sky, stick out your chest. With extension, I'm also not seeing any difference. That helps to confirm that my diagnosis at T7 is neutral, rotated right, side bent left. So now I can move down to segments below move down to T8. I'm also seeing rotation to the right again and T9. I'm also seeing rotation to the right and around T10 I'm not seeing too much deviation. So now coming back up, let's see, so coming back up to T8, go ahead and bend forward and look up to the sky, stick out your chest and then T9, bend forward Look up to the sky, stick out your chest. Good, so those three segments, T7 through T9, uh, all have the same motion preference, which suggests that we have a group dysfunction. T7 to T9, neutral, rotated right, side bent left. Now moving down to our last region, the lumbar spine. We're gonna find our iliac crest, create our little table here, and our area of greatest restriction here seems to be L4 right here. So I'm going to take my middle finger right on the L4 spinous process, middle and thumb on transverse processes, and I'm going to use a long lever approach. Go ahead and cross your arms in front of you. So I want to make sure that I'm side bending and rotating uh, deep enough that I'm able to uh, palpate motion at that segment. So I'm going to come across here and side bend until I feel motion at the lumbar spine, then side bend to the left, until I feel motion at the lumbar spine, and then rotate until I feel motion at that segment, rotate until I feel motion at that segment, and then flex until I feel motion at that segment, and then also again extend using my fingers as a fulcrum and pivoting back on that segment. So what I'm feeling here is um, I'm feeling a freedom of motion in leftward rotation, in left side bending and a freedom in extension, which suggests that my somatic dysfunction is L4 extended rotated left side bent left. So now if I was gonna use a short lever approach, I would come back to my iliac crest, find my spinous process, move out to my transverse processes and gently push anteriorly providing a little counterforce using the iliac crest. And here I'm seeing that my left transverse process is more posterior as I push anteriorly on both sides. I'm finding a greater restriction of motion on the left side and a greater freedom of motion on this right side, suggesting that L4 is rotated to the left. So now we can test that again in flexion extension. So go ahead and bend forward, uh, come back up. Now I wanna make sure I have enough slack in the clothing here. I'm going to make contact again with L4 and go ahead, bend forward. Good. And then come back up and then stick out your chest, bend back and kind of shift your weight back towards me. Good. Okay. All right. So what I'm feeling is during flexion, both transverse processes become more asymmetric with a more leftward rotation. And during extension, they become more neutral.
confirming my diagnosis of L4 extended rotated left, sibent left. 